Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Jen White and David Blaine with Blue Sky Wealth Advisors, and we are now going to start our fourth submission of the Wealth Summit bonus with defined benefit plans. And if you have attended earlier, you realize that this has um, been a bonus from the Wealth Summit that was in California, and David is going to send you through the next presentation of defined benefit plans. David, are you there? Yes. Yes. Okay. After the presentation, we will be uh, addressing any one of their questions. If you can just chat them in the area on your um, right-hand side, you can ask any questions there, and then we'll be uh, happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. But we just want to make sure that we can finish the presentation so we won't be interrupting during it for questions. So go ahead and answer. We'll be, go ahead and answer those at the end of the presentation. All right, David, you all set? I am all set. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jen. You're uh, welcome. So as Jen said, today uh, is the fourth installment of the pension plan design course. Um, I have here just to kind of, I like to refresh everybody where we are in the process because I designed these five webinars to be in a logical order. So we started with a basic overview. We covered some basic retirement plans moving into the safe harbor solo 401k in session two and the uh, advanced i'm sorry i forgot to change the today so last time was the advanced retirement plans with session three and today is the defined benefit pensions and so we've been moving from what i consider the simple to the very complex uh here's our little chart to go over that as well so um, we're here in the column called defined benefit and we're going to talk about the annuity based uh, defined benefit plan and the cash balance defined benefit plan. So up until this point of our pension series, we've been operating here in the IRA based plans in the far right column, as well as in the defined contribution world of 401ks and profit sharing and things like that, things that possibly you're familiar with. So today we're going to move into the world of defined benefit plans, which as you'll see in a moment, you know, some people call traditional retirement or some people even call them old fashioned uh, type of retirement plans. Um, so just to kind of distinguish uh, the 401k profit sharing, those type of plans are what's called defined contribution plans, meaning that the contribution amounts are targeted uh, to the dollar, what's put into the plan, and the ultimate benefit that the employee receives depends on not only the contributions, but the actual gain and losses in the account. So now we're moving into the bottom red square there. A defined benefit targets a benefit amount and is not dependent upon the gain and losses in the account itself. As we'll see later on, essentially what this means is that the employer is absorbing more of the risk than the employee. Now, since we're all business owners here on the call, you may be thinking, you know, why, why would I wanna do that? Well, you gotta put on both your employee hat and your employer hat, and as long as we can manage that risk and make sure that there's a lot of benefit to us as the owner, uh, it certainly can be a very valuable type of retirement plan. So there's two main types of defined benefit plans. Number one is what we call annuity-based, uh, where it targets an income amount. Now, the, the word annuity uh, has a lot of different meanings, uh, a lot of them very negative in the financial service industry, uh, especially if someone walks up to you and says, hey, I'd like to talk to you about an annuity. Uh, you may want to run away. Um, annuity can be a good thing, and typically, uh, a defined benefit plan, when you receive an income for life, it is considered an annuity. And so that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about an annuity that you purchase uh, yourself. We're talking about a lifetime income. So this is where you target an income amount. It's typically guaranteed uh, by the pension plan itself, the assets of the pension plan. And then those little initials there, the PBGC, the benefit Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation uh, is a private company. It's sort of administered by the, the government, the Department of Labor, but it is funded completely by companies that have 
uh, pension plans, and it is there if the if the company goes bankrupt or the the pension plan is underfunded, it's there to provide some sort of backstop of a benefit. So that's the annuity based income where you receive an income for life based on a targeted amount. Number two is the cash balance plan where you're targeting a cash balance, a balance in the account rather than an income stream. So let's talk about that a little bit more here, um, the annuity-based plan. You know, a lot of people would call this a traditional plan or an old-fashioned plan. Essentially today, the only places that offer these are governments. Um, federal and state governments are really the only place that still offer these. Most companies do not offer them on a large scale. However, we'll show you where for a small company, it can, it can be a benefit, but your typical larger companies, uh, there's just a lot of issues with providing a guaranteed income to an unknown number of employees for an unknown duration. Um, it, it causes a lot of problems. But anyway, so these traditional plans would have some sort of eligibility, you know, once you've worked there for you know, five, 10 years. Frankly, this is one of the issues we have with the, the government and states is their, their annuity-based plans are way too generous. You know, they're offering benefits for people for working as little as five years. Um, but anyway, they'll have some type of eligibility uh, years of service. Uh, the plan will be computed generally based on the level of pay and the number of years of service. Typically, they're gonna have a number of payout options. We, we work with a number of clients at IBM and oh my gosh, they have like 25 different payout options. They have, you know, life, joint life, life you know, integrated with social security, period certain, lump sum. There's just numerous ways to pay it out. There's no set way, but typically most people are gonna choose some sort of payment that pays them a monthly income for life, and then you also have the choice for your survivors to have them paid an income for life as well. So there are a number of options in terms of that. They do also a lot of times offer a lump sum, uh, ability to take a lump sum payout, um, but typically you're gonna find if, if the plan is well run and well administered that the lifetime income option is, is generally the better option for, for a large company. So we're going to show an example here being a, a former military. I wanted to pick this, the military retirement plan. Even the governments have changed their plans over the years. This is the current U.S. military retirement plan, and not that you care to become an expert in this, but it has changed significantly over the years to where now it's based on 2% of your pay times the number of years service. So essentially, if you spend 20 years, which is the minimum to receive a benefit, you'll receive 40% of your base pay upon retirement. So if you enter the service at say 25 years old, at the age of 45, you can receive 40% of your base pay for the rest of your life. Uh, they also offer uh, a 25 or 50% lump sum, which will reduce your payments until age 67. And as I mentioned, surviving spouses can continue to receive benefits. Once again, I'm not trying to make you an expert in the military retirement. I just want to give you an example of a traditional defined benefit uh, retirement plan. And the military is, is a good example of that. Now, this is just a little, uh, little comic here. I like to in insert some humor in here. You know, this is a typical wor water cooler discussion these days about when people expect to be working. Uh, in the military, that's one of the attractive things. People can get a retirement check at, at 45 years old. Now, moving beyond your large employers and the governments, let's talk about small business applicability. So there is a very niche case to be made for a small business offering a defined benefit plan. Okay, so let's talk about those. Number one is older owners making significant profits. Now, I share the little guy with the cane, you do not have to be that old, but typically you're gonna wanna be at least 50 years old. Um, you have to be willing or able to make contributions of somewhere eight, you know, 75, $80,000 per year for at least five years, um, or at least until the retirement age. What the IRS really looks 
uh, down upon people that started a defined benefit plan for themselves, throw in you know two or three years of massive contributions for themselves, and then shut it down. Uh, that run a serious legal risk if, if you do that. Number three criteria is few, if any, employees. So once again, we we're, we're putting this in here as a benefit to you guys as and and gals as the owner. You know, we're not trying to recreate the, the federal government's retirement system. And so you really don't want a lot of employees in this. It's going to become very expensive, very quick. And the administrative burden is, is just too much. So few, if any, employees. But for people that are looking for a fast way to put away large amounts of money, this is certainly um, certainly a plan for them. So a little more details. Um, generally, we want to see 250k of earnings per year of more. Now, a lot of you, I know, you know, you've been on the Social Security minimization strategy, paying yourself as an S corp a very low salary. So recall, in tax planning, there's a lot of art and science that goes into this of how much you pay yourself. So you can embark on a Social Security minimization strategy, the new Section 199 qualified business deduction. Uh, would it, it would also encourage you to take a lower salary. On the other side, if you're trying to maximize your Social Security retirement benefits, which is sort of beyond the scope of this, but there are some cases to be made to do that. And then, of course, applicable today is if you're trying to maximize your retirement savings, you want to pay yourself a high salary. So typically, someone that has 250000 or more that they could pay themselves. This is active employment, so any income that you pay FICA tax on. It doesn't count, you know, if you're a limited partner of a business or if you have rental income or something like that. This is active employment, and the trigger for that is if you're paying Social Security and Medicare on it, then it's active employment. I said already, you typically want to be about 50 years or older. Uh, if you're younger than 50, it's just the amount of money you can put away is a lot lower and you have to contribute for such a long time that it's generally not as lucrative. The same goes for someone that's, uh, you want to be under 65 years of age because starting at age 70 and a half, you have to start taking out of the plan and there's generally not enough time to accrue enough money or the tax deferral. It's, it's just not worth it. But the sweet spot is somewhere you know, greater than 50, under 65. Uh, you have to, like I said, be willing to continue the plan until retirement date. So if you pick retirement date for your plan at 65 or 62 or whatever, you have to be willing to keep the plan going until that time. Uh, I mentioned fewer or any employees. You, you can exclude employees that work less than 1,000 hours per year, so essentially part-time people. The other thing you want to be careful of is what we call controlled group issues. So if you have other businesses that have employees or you got to watch your spouse, if they have a business, um, then it can get a little bit confusing and it may not be a good fit if you have multiple businesses with multiple employees. Okay, let's talk a few minutes about the administration of a defined benefit plan. Number one, you have to start the plan by December 31st of the year. The contributions are due by the tax filing deadline, including extensions. Remember, this is all employer contributions. So uh, you have to get your actuaries, you have to compute the tax return, you know, all these different calculations and things like that. So it, it can take a while. So you have until the tax filing deadline to put the money in. Of course, besides the fact that you're putting money in your own retirement account, the reason we're doing this is it's 100% tax deductible for the company, and of course, if you're a pass-through entity like an S-Corp, that flows through for, for your own personal uh, tax rate. There are substantial administrative requirements, and I put in parentheses there, read costs, okay? You know, the requirements cost money. You have to have an actuary, you have to file the IRS Form 5500, um, you have to keep track of, of the benefits paid to uh, employees, and it, it, it's something that you really have to want to, to commit to. How do you get money out of these things? So number one, distributions upon retirement or termination of service. You can roll it over to an IRA. 
uh, you can take an annuity or as I mentioned already, uh, some people do opt to take a lump sum. You're required to stay, take money out after age 70 and a half and there is a 10% early withdrawal penalty before age 59 and a half. And there are some exceptions to that. I don't wanna get into too much on that today. Most of us here on the call are looking to accumulate. We're not really in the distribution phase um, but suffice to say, they're very similar to withdrawing money from, from a, a regular IRA or 401k. Now let's talk about the contribution limits. So number one, these are only employer contributions. Employees do not contribute to a defined benefit plan. Uh, it, you have to fund it annually. This is not like profit sharing where you can decide to do it or not to do it on an annual basis. Uh, the amount does change from year to year. It's based on the computations, based on age of the participants in the plan, the compensation, as well as the targeted retirement age. So the key numbers are the max benefit that can be paid from this. So once you retire, the most you can receive is 100% of your high three years of salary or a maximum of 225,000 so you can't set up a defined benefit plan to pay yourself, you know, a million dollars a year. The most that can be computed is a is a lifetime income of two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. Now there are some. I don't want to get into too many exceptions, but th there are some uh, ways around this, with especially with governmental plans. You may hear, especially in California. You know, some retirees making, you know, 400 and some thousand dollars a year. But but suffice to say, for the general business uh, defined benefit plan, plain vanilla, that is the limit. The max compensation that you can consider when computing that is $280,000 per year. So once again, if you pay yourself, you know, $500,000 a year, only 280000 of that is considered for computing how much you can put into the retirement plan. So just kind of a side note, if you go back to the last presentation to maximize a 401k profit sharing, uh, your salary is gonna be somewhere in the 140,000 max range. Uh, beyond that, only if you get into the defined benefit plan world would you wanna go up to 280,000. Uh, if you're an S Corp or, unless you really have to, there's no reason to pay yourself above those type of, of limits. Okay, so that is the traditional old fashioned defined benefit plan. So recognizing that there were a number of drawbacks to that and, and it wasn't really applicable for a lot of small businesses, there is something called a cash balance plan. A cash balance plan is in fact considered a defined benefit plan, but it's somewhat of a little bit different. If you recall, the annuity-based plan targets an income. So if you work for, you know, let's say you're, you're in the military and your retirement benefit, you would express it in terms of, oh, my retirement is, you know, $3,000 a month for life. A cash balance plan does not do it that way. A cash balance plan targets an account balance. So you see here my little, my little graphic. Um, the plan sponsor makes a fixed contribution to a, an account balance, and they also have an interest credit. So every cash balance plan has an interest crediting rate that that is linked to an index such as the treasury bill. A lot of companies use the 30 year treasury bond. Uh, so let's just assume it's somewhere around 3%. So they're making a contribution here and each account balance gets an interest credit, 3%, uh, you know, 4%, 5%, whatever it is, this will be spelled out in the plan documents. And they take that money and they invest it. The plan sponsor is, is responsible for doing the investing, not the participant. It's invested in one big pool. And in fact, the account balance is what we call a, a hypothetical or theoretical account balance. There is no separate account with, with each employee's name on it. It's one big giant account. You know, the XYZ company 
cash balance plan. And the actuary is the one that keeps track of sort of this notional participant balance. And so you can see if investment returns are below that interest crediting rate, then the plan sponsor is going to have to put in more. If the uh, investment returns are higher, they don't necessarily, they, they always have to put in whatever the interest crediting rate is. And so in this in this type of plan, the investment risks are borne solely by the employer. Uh, when the participant is entitled to receive benefits, you see there they can take either a lump sum or a cash balance plan. They can offer an annuity. Typically, for small businesses, we're going to set this up to have the people take a lump sum and roll it over into an IRA and control it themselves. Once again, as a small business, you don't want to get into administering an annuity um, and have to have this plan set up and run, you know, for 30, 40 years while some person is drawing an annuity from it. If for whatever reason you did want to offer an annuity, um, we'll typically want to arrange something with an insurance company to take over the plan and the administration so that you as the business owner don't really have anything to do with it at a certain at a certain point okay uh, so here's the uh, you know old-fashioned uh, retirement plan begging on the street corner so we don't want anybody to be subject to that at, at all um, okay so now let's talk about the cash balance plan who's a good fit now these are going to be very similar to the defined benefit plan but as we go through this presentation, you'll see I'm, I'm kind of steering you towards the cash balance plan. Uh, very few people are we going to set up a defined benefit plan, but some of these are very, very similar. Um, so older owners who have higher compensation, number one. Number two, desire to contribute more than that 56000 per year, or if you're over age 50, the maximum you can put in is $62,000 to a combination 401k profit sharing. As you recall last time, we talked about the new comparability uh, profit sharing plan. Those maximums are 56 and 62,000 respectively. So for people that wanna put more money away than that, and, and frankly, their company is making more than that, this is a good fit. Uh, the one in the middle there, already contributing a 5% match slash profit share. Once again, go back to last session for those of you that were with me, and I encouraged everyone to consider what's called the 3% non-elective match on the 401k. If you just match participants, if they put something in, then the company puts something in, that's fine if you never go beyond a 401k. But if you want to get into the profit sharing, if you want to get into cash balance plans, things like that, you're going to want to do the 3% non-elective where you give something, 3%, to every employee. So you can see there, if you do the 3% non-elective and then a, a very modest 2% profit sharing, you're going to meet the 5% allocation to every employee, and that is going to meet several of the qualifying tests that you that you have to meet so if you're not willing to do that or you're not already doing that the cash balance plan is not going to work you're not going to be able to get any more or, or significant sums of money into your own account consistent profit this is not something that you can choose to do from year to year so you have to have consistent profit and this will go down a little bit in age. Owners over age 40 who want to accelerate savings, um, it's a little bit unusual. Typically, once again, we're going to be more like 50, but, but on the cash balance plan, because it's not quite as onerous as the defined benefit, the traditional plan, we'll go down to, uh, to age 40. So here I put a little summary of the cash balance versus a defined benefit plan. Um, number one, the defined benefit is a guaranteed lifetime income or the lump sum on the defined benefit plan. Uh, the defined benefit is typically taken as annuity where the cash balance is that guaranteed account balance. So think income versus balance. Uh, the cash balance plan is a hypothetical account. It's not the contributions plus the gain and losses to any individual. And it's typically, we're gonna set these up, 
to take them over as a rollover to an IRA once the once the owner or or other employee becomes eligible. Now, the the comparison between the cash balance and defined contribution, number one, no participation requirement by the employees. The cash balance plan is all funded with employer money. The investment risk is also borne by the employer in a cash balance plan. Uh, I will say that one of the risks of the employees in an, in a cash balance plan, now it's not really a risk because they're getting something for free, but if the crediting interest rate is very low, so for example, if the plan spot, and there's, there's permissible things that they can pick, they can't pick you know, 1%, there's certain permissible things that they can pick, but if they pick a permissible interest crediting rate that is very, that's low and lower than could be uh, earned on the outside, you know, investing in a 401k or whatever. So there is some risk to the employee that the, the, the cash balance at the end could be less than if they did it on their own. But the reality is it's, it's essentially free money to the employee. The cash balance plan can offer the annuity option, as I said, as opposed to defined contribution. Uh, there is no annuity option. And then the cash balance plan does have the pension benefit guarantee, corp guarantee, although I put an asterisk there, I don't want to get into that. Most professional firms are not going to be subject to that. Although the premiums, I think for this year, it's only like $50 a, a participant um, per year, the, the premium to pay into that. Okay, let's, I know this is a little bit small, but I wanted to get this up here. This gives you an idea of the maximum contributions for plans. So over there on the left, you see um, the age of, assumably, the, the owner. Um, so I've highlighted you know, age 40, 50, 60, 70, and then considered earnings. You'll notice they stop at 280. There's no, you can't consider more earnings than that. Um, so looking at the age 40 person, you can see that if they make $50,000 a year, you can put $83,000 into a cash balance plan on their behalf. Now, assuming you meet all the testing requirements and things like that. Now, the reason I point that out is I want to notice it. And you guys can see at 75,000, the max is 93,372 at 100, 150. So in this particular case, th there's a real science behind figuring out what you pay yourself as an owner. So there would be no incentive whatsoever for a 40-year-old to pay themselves more than $75,000 in terms of the cash balance plan. But you can go all the way up here and let's look at a 60-year-old. You can see that making $200,000 a year, you get to put $258,000 into his cash balance plan, which of course is a tax deduction uh, to to the company, so you can see that the numbers get pretty pretty eye opening there. And these are the maximum. You don't have to do the maximum if your company isn't generating enough profit, but um, it, it's a really a great way to reduce your tax and put a lot of money away for for retirement. Okay, the calculations, uh, how, how, you know, this chart here, you know, how did we come up with these numbers? Well, it's based on actuarial computations. Number one, time value of money to maximize the benefits. So somebody that's gonna retire in five years needs to have more money put in their account than somebody that has 50 years to retire. Uh, same thing with higher pay. If you know, someone that makes $200,000 a year, you're targeting that, you have to put more money in. You have to factor in the assumed interest rate um, for the actuarial calculations. And the, the calculations are very involved and you, you have to use some software and actuary and things like that. But I just kind of want to give you an idea of thinking about how these calculations are made, thinking about how much you make now, when you're going to retire and the time value of money. As with all these retirement plans, they are subject to testing, discrimination testing. Uh, they have to pass non-discrimination uh, non testing. Um, it must be non-discriminatory on a benefit basis. 
So someone that makes less, you don't have to put in the same amount, but the benefit must be actuarial equivalent. So for the traditional defined benefit plan, it's that monthly or annual income stream that has to be the same. For a cash balance plan, it's that target balance and a quality of proportional outcome. This is not a quality of outcome. It's a quality of proportional outcome. If you have somebody that's making $25,000 a year, you do not have to put away enough for them to make 100,000 in retirement. It's proportional. Um, and this contribution as amount is converted to a projected um, benefit. And this is, uh, you know, we see this a lot with people um, you know, with the retirement, they're saying, you know, they're typically not saving enough, uh, or before they know it, they're like age 55 and they look around and they realize they haven't done a lot for retirement. The cash balance plan is a wonderful tool for those business owners who have been focused on building the business and really haven't been, um, focused a lot on saving for their own retirement. And, and, I, and I say retirement, I really should say passive income. Uh, you know, we're all about generating passive income through, uh, you know, investments, uh, real estate. It can be a business, you know, if your goal is to own your business passively. But the retirement plan is one of those streams of income that when when you want to stop going to the office every day, day after day working, it's one of those passive streams of income that we want people to develop. And, and a cash balance plan is a wonderful way to create uh, a nice income stream. Okay, so similar to the cross-tested uh, profit sharing plan, you can create different groups and segregate people, owners, non-owners, you know, doctors, nurses, professionals, admin, whatever, to create different groups. And you can really get very creative in the way that you do it. Uh, some of the tests that have to be passed, contribution gateway test, average benefits test, and what we call minimum participation test. So the contribution gateway means that all employees need to receive some benefit. You can't exclude you know, people from any sort of benefit. You can't favor too much, and this is where you know, it becomes beneficial, highly compensated employees. And this gateway contribution is sort of the price of admission to get into the, the cash balance plan itself. Um, okay, the average benefits test, uh, once again, we look at what the, the benefit is to the employee and you can't skew it towards highly compensated employees. Um, it's converted to this equivalent benefit accrual rate and the demographics of the company really drive the results to make sure that the average benefits test is being met. So you have to make sure that as a group, certain groups are not being overly favored uh, against other ones. Now, the minimum participation test is a, is a little bit different one for the defined benefit cash balance plan. Um, this plan must benefit at least 40% of the group's non-excluded employees and so or at least 50 employees which means you can't set up a cash balance plan you know if you have a company with 15 people you can't set it up to benefit one person you the owner <laughs> now it has to benefit at least 50 people or the way it's defined as benefit is it has to have a benefit accrual rate of at least a half a percent that's what it means by benefit. So when we say must benefit at least 40%, um, it means that at least 40% of the employees must have an accrual benefit rate of greater than a half a percent. Now the other 60% are gonna get some benefit from it. If you recall the gateway test and some of the other testing, they're gonna get some benefit. But so this could be an example of if you had a bunch of really young employees, maybe lower paid, you're not having to put in much at all on an annual basis and their benefit accrual rate could be below that half a percent, uh, but at least 40% of the company has to have a high accrual rate above a half a percent. Okay, so we're gonna move now to a uh, case plan study, if I can get this to work like, right. Um, 
if you can, uh, Jen, if you can let me know, make sure the cash balance yep. plan is Love there. That. Okay, great. Um, so this is a, um, so I use software, I've used pension design software to do this, and I created this hypothetical company um, for 2019, minimum age of service of 21. It's actually a C or it, it's actually an S core. It doesn't really matter for purposes of plan design. C versus S corp is a, a tax distinction. It's not a retirement plan distinction. Um, so minimum age, uh, minimum service of 12 months. Now this, what I'm going to show you is the real power of the cash balance plan is a cash, you can see here in the middle retirement benefit, cash balance plus 401k plus profit sharing. I mean, this is just an amazing plan. This is the way that you can really sock away a lot of money. You could set up a standalone cash balance plan, um, but generally what we're going to want to do is cash balance plus 401k plus profit sharing. It gives us the most flexibility. It gives us um, it allows us to pass all those tests a lot easier, and, and, and it gives us the ability to get the owners the most money. For this particular one, I did a 5% crediting rate, um, and then we had uh, different classes, the owner, highly compensated employees, non-highly compensated employees, and then the non-owner, highly compensated employees. I just did 100% vesting here for this one um, and some of the other uh, assumptions. Okay, so here's a census. I have 17 employees. We got two owners here um, that are uh, late 40s, 50, 48, 54. Um, their earnings and they're both owners. And you can see the rest of the people. We have some 40, 50. We have some low earnings in the 20s. Some some really low earning people. And then we have another person popping in over 100,000. Then we have, I cre this person is a actually the highest paid person in the company um, who is not an owner of, of age 50. So the total earnings for this company was $943,000. Okay, so now there's a lot of information on this slide, but, but I want to go through and tell you. So we have here the cash balance column. Uh, the 401k deferral amount, the safe harbor. Remember, we picked the 3% non-elective and then the profit sharing. And then over here is the total contribution. So let's walk through the two owners. So number one, the cash balance, we wanted to target to see if 80% of the benefit could accrue um, to them. So you can see this owner, the 48-year-old, got about 75000 uh, this one about 90,000. That's on that amount of earnings. If we raise the earnings, we could get this um, up higher. Now, I just put this together and I wanted it to pass all the testing. And I wanted to show you an example of this. This plan is what we call zero cost to the, to the owners. And, and I'll show you that in a minute. But I, I could have tweaked it some more probably to get some more benefit out of it. But I just wanted to show you for illustrative purposes. So the the 25 the greater than 50 year old is doing 25,000 in deferral, and the under 50 19,000. The owners you can exclude from the safe harbor 3% non-elective, which we're typically going to do. Um, the same thing with the profit sharing is I've excluded the owners from the safe harbor and the profit sharing amount. And why is that? Is because you can get a bigger bang for the buck over here on the cash balance side, typically, than the profit sharing side. Everyone else is getting their 2% cash balance uh, allocation. You can see very few people are participating in the 401k itself. And so we're able to overcome that low participation by using the 3% safe harbor. Everybody gets 3% if they participate or not. On the profit sharing side, we bumped uh, some people up to 10%, but look, we were able to take this highly compensated employee. Um, he's doing, he's getting safe harbor already. He's getting cash balance. So we thought he was getting too much money. So I just wanted to show you, we cut his profit sharing down to 2% you're allowed to discriminate against highly compensated employees. That was the point of me doing that 
is you don't have to give them what you give what's called the rank and file employees. So you can see here the total contributions amount in this line, the two owners, 93 and $114,000 respectively into their account. Both of them received greater than 100% of their earnings into a retirement account. That's pretty phenomenal. Uh, down here, you see we actually got um, this highly compensated employee, 13,000. We actually gave more to this guy here, um, employee N, than the highly compensated employee. The point of this is you can discriminate against these highly compensated uh, employees. So now, whoops, um, down here on the total contribution amount, you can see the employer cost to the principals, this line here, 80% of the benefit, or I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, 80% of the employer cost went to, to them, total 63% um, of, of the contributions went to the employers, the, the owners, and then 36% went to the non-principals. Um, so that's a pretty good number, 63 versus 36. Um, this is just a, a graphical representation of that. Okay, so here's what I wanna get. This takes the total contribution, so the employer had to kick in $259,000 of, of money. Estimated tax savings in the 37% bracket was $96,000. So the net cost after tax savings was 163, and they got $164,000 put in their own account. So you can see that the net cost of the plan, and, and I don't mean like ad, there's gonna be some admin costs to this. I mean, cost of the plan considering contributions that essentially they put $164,000 in their own account for no cost whatsoever giving money to the employees because of all the tax savings. Essentially the tax savings instead of paying the federal government, it went to the employees and they got to put that in their own account. The rest of the report is um, some, of the, uh, some of the testing. So this was the, um, the normal cost report that looks at um, the target, target amount and the accrued benefit. So this is, this is in the background, there's all sorts of formula. What was the accrued benefit for them? $1,200, where you can see some of these other lower paid people, it was basically four, $4 of accrued benefit. The testing, the minimum participation test, this is what I was talking about before. These people down here don't have an accrual rate of greater than a half a percent. Um, they do get something, but their accrued benefit is very low, but you had enough people accrual rate greater than a half a percent, so the plan passes uh, testing. Here was your average benefit um, percentage test, and the average here, 20.91 for the owners, employees. We probably could have got this down if I would have played with some more. It's probably a, a little generous on the contributions to the employees if, if you really wanted to drive some more cost out of it. Um, so this has to be at least 70%. The average benefit test on this is 132%. So it's way more generous than, than, than we need to be. Um, minimum allocation gateway testing here um, passes, of course. And we, and we knew that because everyone was getting at least um, the 5%, the 3% the, the non-elective, and then the 2% um, cash balance. Um, so anyway, just some more uh, some more testing of rate groups. So as you recall, the rate groups you have to have um, each group of employees uh, has to you can't discriminate in in favor of particular rate groups. Um, so anyway, I don't want to bore you with all the details of of the testing, but suffice to say, this plan passes um, passes all of of the testing. Okay, so that's an example of a plan that the key things to zero in on here, are right here in the 37% tax bracket, is essentially no cost to the owners of this plan. Uh, you can see in the 12% bracket, they're put, taking 64,000 out of their pocket, essentially. 
And then the other thing that I wanted to emphasize was just the total um, benefit accrued. You know, each of them got over 100% of what they were paid into a retirement plan. Okay. So next time um, we're going to talk about non qualified deferred compensation, which is sort of the wild west of pension plan design. There's not a lot of rules um, because it's non-qualified. You can do um, you know, all sorts of different things, but that'll be, that'll be next time. That'll be our final session. But um, so anyway, that's, that's what we have for today. Uh, I'd like to open it up now for, uh, for questions if we have any. You've done such a good job, David. I don't think there's any questions that they were able to even come up with. It's just been a really, really helpful and, and, and full presentation. There's nothing that anyone's been asking so far. Okay. Well, we'll give a minute if anybody has anything to, um, to type into the chat box. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned already, just unless it's a really unusual circumstance, we're going to, we're going to steer people towards the cash balance plan as opposed to the traditional defined benefit plan. Um, our custodian that we work with um, every day is Charles Schwab is for, for our clients. Um, they actually offer a small business defined benefit plan that's fairly low in administrative fees and they take care of a lot of the administrative burden. So we do have a good um, program that we can use, but we typically find that the flexibility and the benefits of the cash balance plan are, are going to be a little bit better for, for people. Um, one thing to note, uh, if you're looking at these advanced plan designs, uh, cash balance, if you're looking to add that, or back from last session, the cross-tested profit sharing plan, uh, make sure you're aware that you know your, your plan amendments, you're usually going to want to be done if you're going to change or add something to your plan. You usually have to notify the participants, especially if you have a safe harbor plan. A lot of people have a safe harbor 401k, so if you're going to change anything, you need to notify participants uh, generally by October the 1st. So if, if you're thinking of doing something different, you're going to want to start doing it certainly by the summer. Um, these, these plans can take a while to design, to set up and design. Um, so don't wait. It's not a last minute sort of, oh my gosh, I, I have an extra $400,000. What do I do with it? Uh, type of decision. This is something that you need to start. You need to start on early. Um, if you do have any other questions though, how about we switch to that last slide so they can go ahead and, sure. and write down the information? Sure. So yeah, yeah. So we don't have any questions today. That's great. Um, but happy to, you know, if I see you at a conference or whatever, grab me, or if you have any questions, most of you have my email. We have our generic info at blue sky WA email here that of course will get to me as well. But, um, also, we wanted to mention um, that your book came out too, and um, we wanted to just kind of let you guys know that all of this and more is also covered in David's book, Invest in Your Life, Not Just Your Portfolio, which is available on Amazon and has had some really wonderful reviews so far. So I just wanted to let you guys know about that as well. Yeah, no, thanks, Jenna. Yeah, it is it is out, and um, it's, it's pretty good, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> David... Uh, I'll admit David David Finkel actually wrote um, is, is one of the uh, you know dust jacket. Um, he wrote an endorsement for the book, so yeah. we're pretty pretty psyched about that too. Okay, um, Jen, do you have the date for the next one? I, I don't handy, but as I said already, the the last installment of this uh, series will be on non qualified um, deferred comp uh, pension plans. Let's see. I am. Let's see. That's right. Well, wait, it'll come out by, yeah. by email. You'll have the invitations going out um, within the first. Uh, it's going to be May 9th is the May is 9th. the next one. Okay. Okay. Well, so May 9th, we'll see you again, and that'll be the Wild West one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Talk to you thanks soon. Thanks a lot, David. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Uh, 